It's 70 years since the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that racially segregated public schools were unconstitutional. That decision on May 17, 1954, came in a bundle of cases, one of which originated in Virginia. Barbara Johns, a black student in Prince Edward County, turned to the federal courts, arguing that the rundown shack of a high school she and other youngsters of color were forced to attend meant they were denied a quality education. Specifically, that black students were robbed of the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection under the law. Perhaps the strongest argument in that case, Prince Edward County, about an hour south of Richmond, provided safe, clean, well-equipped schools for white students. Just because segregated public schools were ruled illegal didn't mean that segregated public schools didn't endure in Virginia. It would be another 14 years after another Supreme Court decision in a case out of New Kent County before segregation would draw its last breath. Virginia had to be dragged kicking and screaming into allowing black kids and white kids to study in the same classrooms. Still heavily rural and conservative, but with its more moderate suburbs, which now dominate the state, just starting to grow, a Virginia controlled by old white guys decided to defy the Brown decision. The state adopted a policy of massive resistance and closed public schools rather than desegregate them. Schools were closed in Norfolk, Charlottesville, and Warren County. Massive resistance began in 1956 and continued for three years until the state and federal courts, in decisions issued concurrent with the anniversary of General Robert E. Lee's birthday, told Virginia it could defy the law no longer. Those schools in Prince Edward were the last to reopen in 1964 with a nudge from a presidential commission. In the years since the Brown decision, segregation has been perpetuated by economic inequality, the housing gap, that poverty has become a multi-generational trap. In Richmond, a majority minority city, one in three school-age children lives in poverty. For the state, that figure is just over one in 10. That's a reminder of Virginia's overall prosperity, a prosperity attributed to the growth of the suburbs, the transformation of the state's economy from agriculture to manufacturing to services, and that a lot of Virginians are well-educated and well-paid. But the state's growth and the evolution of its economy have not come without a price. That price is climbing in part because Virginia, seven decades after the Brown decision, is still dealing with the consequences of court-ordered desegregation. The most significant consequence? The resegregation of schools. The legislature's investigative arm says Virginia is shorting public schools by more than $3 billion, that education is better funded in surrounding states. A big part of the problem? A complex formula for determining how much money Virginia should steer to each school system. Governor Glenn Youngkin, a Republican, didn't put much stock in that funding study. His administration said investigators relied on fuzzy math. Besides, Youngkin is not keen on traditional public schools. He argues that there should be competition in public education, that there should be alternatives to the usual school setting. That's why the governor is pushing so-called lab schools. They're basically public schools operated in many instances by colleges and universities. Democrats who now fully control the legislature, largely because they're tight with the teachers' union, aren't giving Youngkin the many millions he'd like for even more lab schools. But the do-over budget includes some extra cash for those schools and a bunch of Democratic priorities. For example, pay raises for teachers that are bigger than those favored by Youngkin. Also, there's more money for schools with more kids from impoverished families. These discomforting issues of race, however, endure. In some respects, they're as hot as they were back in the 1950s when the courts were confronting segregation. In Shenandoah County, a heavily white, largely rural spot 
on the state's mountainous western spine, the school board voted to restore the Confederate names of two schools renamed after the death of George Floyd in 2020. Those who wanted the schools again named for Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Turner Ashby said that reflected their heritage. There's a loaded term if there ever was one. It's right up there with massive resistance. For the Richmond Times-Dispatch, this is Jeff Shapiro.